Hello and welcome to the seventh episode of Vlogs Crosscheck Podcast. My name is Robin and today we have a um, new guest that was actually recommended to me in one of the comments. So thank you so much for recommending me, John Trisley here on the podcast. Keep sending in those recommendations and make sure to share this video with your favorite aviation YouTuber. So hopefully we can have him on the show as well. But let's first check the intro. Hey there everyone, John from Trisley Traveling. As a longtime Ave Geek and frequent traveler, John shares his passion for aviation on his YouTube channel. But John does more than just trip reports. And today we'll get to know more about him and traveling gluten free. So welcome to Fulox Crosscheck Podcast. Trisley Traveling. Hello John, welcome to the podcast. Hey Robin, thanks for having me. <laughs> How's it going? Um, pretty good. The nerves have kicked up again, <laughs> not surprisingly, but anyway, we'll make it through, I think. Of course. Well, just a quick, uh, intro for the folks who, um, don't know you yet, because I certainly didn't know you until a couple of weeks ago when I, I got, um, you recommended in one of my comments. Uh, do you just want to explain a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, you want me to go all the way back to the beginning or might as well, <laughs> I guess how we got here today. <laughs> so, um, let's see where to begin. I think I joined YouTube way back in like 2006. Um, I have no idea why I joined YouTube back in 2006. I don't, I don't have any recollection of, of what I was doing back then. Um, the interesting thing is I don't think I posted my first video on YouTube until, um, I think 2011. Mm -hmm which is, which is a super long time. And <clears throat> interesting thing is back in those days, I, I could, I could easily tell you, I didn't really enjoy traveling at all. Um, I, which I think is kind of a unique, uh, thing for someone who does trip reports today. But, uh, so, um, I'm going to take us back a step even further. So I grew up in Seattle. So, so re really my, my love for airplanes really started as a kid in Seattle. I remember going to the Boeing factory. Um, obviously, if you live in Seattle and you like airplanes, you come across somebody who, who works at Boeing, who knows something about Boeing, and you, you can probably get a tour, a special tour. I wish I remembered details of those, those kind of tours of those days, but I really don't remember too much about the, the tours, right? Mm -hmm. So. But I remember just my, my bedroom had pictures of airplanes, model airplanes, you know, everything hanging from the ceiling, all that kind of stuff. Fast forward a few years uh, and my family moved from Seattle to a couple different states. And over those, over those years, I kind of lost track of airplanes. I didn't really keep up with airplanes, didn't, didn't really fly much from the time I was probably, gosh, junior high through college, you know, I did very little traveling. You know, if I did traveling is by car and believe it or not, during those years, I actually developed a fear of flying, <clears throat> which is, which when I tell people that today, they go, what? <laughs> um, and, and then I can, I can, cause I can show my, my travel map these days and I'm up to almost 300 flights under my belt these days. Whoa. And so, uh, that turned around quite a bit anyway. So made it through college and got my first job and I, I, part of that job, but it looked like I was going to have to go to France for that job. Um, and so I, I was like, man, I don't know if I can get on an airplane, and fly all the way over to France. That was, that was kind of a crazy thought. It's a long way. It is a long way. Yeah. Um, I was living in Wisconsin at that, at that time, work, working for a, a, an air conditioning company. So they have a subsidiary in uh, France or they mm -hmm. did. I don't know if they still do, but <laughs> regardless of that, uh, th that trip never took place, but, it reminded me that as a kid, I had told my mother that I would take her to Paris. Um, my parents are teachers, so they, they, they didn't really have much, much money. Um, and I was, I graduated college as an electrical engineer. Um, kind of a side note, Trisity is um, my original gamer tag. And electrical engineer is working with electricity and so I just took the elec off and anyway, so that's where Trisity comes from, by the way. I was going to ask you that. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that's another one. It's it's often a lot of people try ZD and I'll, it's if I say I'm an electrical engineer and I work with electricity, they go, oh, that makes more <laughs> sense now. So anyway, anyway, so um, as I said, I was reminded that I was going to take my mother to Paris. That was a promise I made probably, you know, like a five-year-old kid. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I, you know, I was contemplating this, this trip to Europe um, really outside of Paris anyway. I'm like, well, let's just do that. And so in 2009, I actually took my mother to London and excuse me, London and Paris. Um, and really that was a transformative trip for me. It was, I still remember looking out the window and I didn't know what we were doing at the time, but we were in a hold outside of London Heathrow, right? And you're doing the circles. I didn't know what that was. I, I'd been away from airplanes really for 20 years maybe. And, and so, so that's in 2009, I start kind of re-energizing myself in the airplane world. Well, I did some filming of that landing and subsequently we went to Paris and I filmed part of the takeoff from Paris. So somewhere after 2009 and before I posted that first video, I got back on YouTube and I realized, Hey, people are doing this. People are, are posting videos of, of takeoff and landings. I don't think I found a trip report back then. I'm like, well, I've got, I've got this footage back here on my camera that I haven't done anything with for two years. And I found an editor and I put it together and I ended up posting it. And I think that's my, um, I think that's my very first posting um, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I, I've renamed it since as my very first video. And I, it's the takeoff from Paris, um, Charles de Gaulle. And, and really that started me on the road where I'm at today. And, and uh, I, we can get into that a little, a little bit more, but so that's, that's kind of how I got into YouTube. Um, need a drink. Sorry. It's the nerves. Yeah, they're getting better <laughs> as I go through my story here. So, um, boy, what year was that? Anyway, I ended up moving back and I live in Idaho now. I live outside of Boise, um, Boise. Um, and you know, as an electrical engineer, I worked for the local utility. I, I actually don't anymore, but I worked for the local utility and really got promoted from just an engineer in, in my particular department to, you know, higher levels of being the senior engineer, principal engineer in, the, in that department, eventually became the manager of that department. And as the manager of the department um, and principal engineer of the department, I was expected to participate on various committees around the country. And so if you look at my early videos, they're mostly takeoff and landings. And that probably from 2011 up to, I think 2016, all I really did is just stick the camera in the window and, and record the takeoff and the landing. That's all, all I really did. And I, I continue to watch YouTube over those years and somewhere in there. Um, and I, I still don't remember what inspired me or who inspired me or, you know what it was, but back in 2016, I'm like, I, I think I could probably do this, this trip report thing. Um, and you know, my, my channel at that point, before I had done the trip report, I had, I had probably 120 subscribers, something like that. And I, I wasn't necessarily looking to get more subscribers at the time, but I started doing the trip reports and then suddenly the subscriber count started going up. And I realized how cool that was. <laughs> it sure is. So. And you you do have just over 2,000 subscribers right now. And actually, yep. when I found your channel, it was at 1.99K. And when I clicked yep. that button and refreshed the page, I saw it jump to 2.0K. So I'm very, yep. very proud to be your 2,000th subscriber. Uh, so congrats yep. with 2,000. But still, I, I did, I did want to ask you, because if you... If you're on YouTube for so long and you've been uploading hundreds of videos now at this point, 2000 for like for me, 2000 is still a long way out. I mean, uh, but 2000 is also not a lot for being on YouTube for this long. Can you explain right. why it's at this level? Um, I that's an interesting question. I I didn't you know, posting takeoffs and landings. Um, 
a couple of them have, have gotten a lot of views. Uh, one of them in particular, Landing in Salt Lake City, is one of my more popular videos. I think it's 25,000 views or something like that. Um, I, I, it, it's, it's the mystery of the YouTube world. I, you know, and, and unless somebody knows who you are or knows how to search for you or search for something very specific, I knew very little about how to, you know, thumbnail. I knew very little about how to probably put tags and put a meaningful description in a video. So I, I didn't really help myself either because I, I did very little research. It was, it was really when I was posting the, the takeoff and landing videos, especially was really just because I enjoyed flying and, and was, was, I guess, learning how to enjoy flying more and the process of recording the takeoff landing and then posting that on YouTube was just, was just kind of fun. You know, I just did it as kind of a hobby. It was there was real, really no intent behind any of those things. I think it was just like, hey, let's just record this and I'll throw it up on YouTube. And if people watch it, great. If they don't watch it, great. So after I started gaining subscribers, really with the trip reports, it became more, you know, more of a search for what's the, what's the best way to do this. Um, and so I really feel like um, starting in so kind of in starting in 2016 till now, I've really gone from essentially zero to the 2000. So I'm kind of, I, I kind of feel like this is my maybe third YouTube iteration. And, and that's really a, a kind of, kind of my starting spot in a lot of ways. That's what it feels like at least. I want to just share a quick clip with you because something that I noticed, which you, you've started doing, which is a quite unique thing because you have started mixing up, um, the uh, commentary, the voiceover, but also um, a more unique way of doing text on the screen. Um, if you, can you yeah. uh, confirm that you can see the screen? I can see it. Perfect. So that's watch a couple of seconds of this clip right here. The guru says the seat is 19 inches wide and 32 inches of seat pitch. This flight included a so i think you some way discovered motion tracking um yep. can, can you explain what what you've been going through over the past couple or well, years really since you started sure. doing um these strip reports of how you developed your style okay yeah so i went back and in prep for this a little bit i, I you know engineers tend to, to prep for things and get ready and Anyway, so I went back and looked at some of my early trip reports and they are just kind of, you know, they're, they're the typical text on screen that people do when they first get started. Right. It's, it's not, an, it's very, I think it's more common that people do text on the screen than do a voice commentary or show themselves when they, when they first start, you know, a lot of the channels that I watch, um, there's a, a channel that I've started watching and he, he's fairly, I think he's fairly new in the trip report world and he does they're they're beautiful graphics, but it's just text on screen. So I think that that's where I started. I don't think I did my first um, use of my own voice until I think last year, 2019 was the first time that I used my own voice on a video, let alone my own face on a video. Um, so I've only been appearing, actually appearing on the screen for about a year now. Um, so that, that's, that's still a fairly new thing for me. Um, but as an engineer, I don't think it's unique to engineers. I'm kind of a, a tech geek. I, I, I like gadgets. I like new cameras. I like to explore the technology. And so I, I'm trying to think somewhere probably three years ago, I, I started using Adobe Premiere Pro to do my editing. Yeah. Um, and in that process, I, you know, I'm still watching other videos on YouTube. And I remember uh, before I went to the Maldives, so probably in 20, this would probably have been 2016, 20, early 2017. I'm watching videos about the Maldives in preparation for our trip. And I, I, I saw this clip and the, this guy has um, the name of the restaurant they're going to floating in the air and he walks through it and into the restaurant. I'm like, well, that was really cool. I like that a lot. So I started, as I, as I see some effects, um, 
I'm like, well, I, how do I do that? I've got this, this fancy high end editing program. I, I got to be able to do that too. Turns out you do that in after effects. And, and, and so it's all part of the, the uh, subscription model that Adobe goes to now. But uh, so I, I, I fell in love with that kind of floating text kind of feel attach the text to whatever the seat, um, a point on the ground. Cause I, I, I really like looking out the window and seeing the ground and, you know, I always wonder what's going on down there and what people are doing and are they looking up at my airplane that kind of stuff. And so, you know, the, the push pin thing that I do on a lot of my videos today, um, I just, just things like that as I, as I'm either watching or, or making the video, it's like, what other cool thing could I do? Um, <clears throat> it's just kind of a, I, I like playing with my toys, I guess. And so, uh, um, I have, I have the time and I have the, the ability to, to research some of this stuff now. And so I try to work them in. Um, I, I don't want them to, to really take over and be an effects show. That's not really what I'm trying to go for. Um, on that particular clip you showed, the, my favorite part of that one is when, when you slide the cover of the mirror over. That's exactly why like, I took that part. That, that's actually my, one of my favorite effects. And that when I figured out how to do that, that was, I, I'm kind of proud of myself for that one. Cool. But so my style it has really evolved a lot over the last, you know, since I started doing trip reports four years ago, um, you, really this last year has been significantly different, you know, with, with doing my voiceover, appearing on video, being worried about the balance of the music versus the voice and the ambient noise and all those things. I, I look back at some of my early videos and the volume is just out of control <laughs> and it's, it's uh, something I've been trying to fix. Actually. Um, the, the video you showed was originally posted, but way back in 2017, I guess. And so I, I actually took it down, which hurt my view count. Cause that was a, one of my more popular videos. I had like 45,000 views on it, but Whoa. took that one down and re remade it to, to my, I guess my current standard and I, and I put it back up. So anyway, so that's where that, that's kind of where we're at today. Um, and you know, I, I keep, I, I subscribe to a few after effects and premiere people on YouTube and they, they put out new videos every week and I look, I look at those for new ideas and, and just kind of see what happens. Cause you know, I, I have a fairly good rig so I can do a lot of these various effects. I mean, if you don't have a decent rig, some of those effects are, are excruciatingly long to, to do. Uh, oh yeah. But yeah, you probably need a, uh, like an, an external graphics card to be able to, to render that. Like I, I, I've been using after effects a little bit lately. Uh, I, I had to like when Alex Perglowski was on the podcast here, well, mm -hmm. obviously he doesn't show his face. So with after effects, I had to render the, um, the visualization of the, the voice. And sure. that had been rendering for like three hours for like a one hour thing. So, yep. but if you do that much extra with, with the motion tracking on your videos, doesn't that add up a lot of extra time to, to your editing process? It, it really does. I, I, I give myself, um, I, I usually give myself a week. To, to actually complete a video. Obviously I'm not sitting here at my desk for the entire week doing the video. You um, don't? <laughs> no, I, so I like, like yesterday. Um, I, so this week, this week's trip, and, and I think we'll get to that a little bit more. Um, I, I look, gosh, I've got all kinds of thoughts. Every trip is a chance to learn something new, right? So, on this, I, I went to a suction cup mount to record uh, takeoff and landings because one of the things that does cut down that week is the quality of your, of your content, you know, pre-edited content. Do you have good, stable, uh, non-shaky video? Because um, I think it was Blake, when I watched his, he talked about shaky video and, and having it level and everything and how, he, how much those irritated him or frustrated him. I don't remember what you've already used. I completely agreed with that. The quality of your, your footage will dictate in, in my world, at least the quality of the footage di dictates how quickly I can edit the video. So I learned yesterday that 
Um, a Southwest 737 inner kind of window pane is super flimsy. So my suction cup mount vibrated, terrible vibration. I mean, it was, it, you could visibly see it doing this. Right. A um, little different than like an A350, which is very solid. Even the A220 is very solid. And so I'm still debating whether I'm going to use that footage or not because it's so irritating. And, and using Premiere, you can stabilize it to some extent. Um, but it doesn't look very good. You get that kind of like, my, my daughter calls it kind of this like seasick effect, right? It kind of like you get a wave through the video. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it's a rolling shutter, um, right? Yeah. And, and, and so I, that bothers me too. So I'm kind of a stickler. I, that's kind of my priority these days is I want, I've always wanted my footage to be the best quality it could, which is, you know, in 2016, part of the switch to trip reports is I, I got a 4k camera for the first time. And so I've always tried to really have the best kind of footage I, I can get. And I've, everything I do over the years has really been to try to keep that footage getting better and better and better, higher quality, more stable, all those things. So I, I noticed that so anyway, Oh, sorry. But Carry to, 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 to make the point is that effect um, the the 10 minutes of takeoff that it captured with the suction cup mount took like four, four and a half hours to finish the stabilizing analysis. And so all day yesterday, I'm, I'm super excited to, I haven't been on an airplane for so long and I'm super excited. I've got a trip report. I'm like, yes, I get to do what I really love to do. And computer is just chewing on this stabilizing all afternoon yesterday. It was very frustrating. So <laughs> anyway. But one thing I noticed though, is that you have decided not to add the takeoff as part of your, your videos. You, you speed it up and then you have yep. a separate channel for that. Uh, Tri Trinity loves traveling work. Yep. And like I tried something like that as well. It didn't work out for me, but you have deliberately chosen to start a separate channel for your takeoff and uh, landing footage. Why is that? Mm -hmm. um, people didn't watch the takeoff and landings like they watched the trip reports. So it, I, I found that I was spending a lot of time doing takeoff and landing videos uh, and plane spotting videos and people on the main channel really didn't want to watch those. I mean, the analytics said the primary analytic is the view count. Right. So if I get, if I get 200 views in the first day on a trip report and I get 10 on a takeoff and landing video, it didn't really seem like it, the juice didn't seem worth the squeeze on that one. So as I was like, well, you know, I'll, I'll throw all this aviation stuff, which is really in my mind, even more niche than a trip report is trip reports. I think are pretty common for people to, to look at, but, being a, a real av geek kind of person is more of a, a niche. And so I just said, well, let's just, let's just put that over there on this other channel and really redirect this channel to be trip reports. And then I like to do like destination tour videos. I went to NASA this year in, in Houston tours that tours like that. I wanted to put on this channel, even those don't get a ton of views. They're, those are more like a, a slow burn video. People watch them. Hey, I think I'm going to go to the Johnson space center in Houston. I wonder if there's any videos on YouTube and then you get a bunch of counts. Um, I did a resort review for the Tahiti village in Las Vegas where we visited last year. And, you know, as the lockdowns have started to ease and Las Vegas is open, I've gotten a lot of views in the last couple of weeks on that particular video as well. So, you know, those are, those are kind of really specific to um, people wanting to go on a particular holiday. So I, it, it's just a, I don't know. It's just kind of a way to make, make my life easier, actually. Fair, fair enough. Would you say that um, you let analytics affect your channel? Um, probably the only analytic that I let affect my channel is probably the view count. Um, I, I, I've not delved really deeply into all the analytics that, that uh, YouTube gives us. Um, which may sound weird as an engineer that I don't look at all the numbers and stuff, but uh, it, it just didn't, I, I, I really am looking for kind of the engagement. If I get comments from people and questions, Hey, ultimately I would like to be um, seen as a resource for people. 
you know, when they're, when they're traveling and they have questions about, about, you know, travel, particular airplanes, airlines, things like that. I, I really appreciate, um, it makes me feel good when people ask me questions. Hey, I'm thinking about flying. Um, last week I got a question. I think I'm flying. This guy was going to fly from, <clears throat> I think Miami to New York to Tel Aviv on Delta. And he wanted to know if he should upgrade to Comfort Plus. Right. So he, he and I ended up having a, a, I guess, long for YouTube comment conversation about that. I, I don't know if he ever ended up doing it, but uh, I gave him my perspective on those things. And um, I, I hope he did it. I think he, I think he should. But <laughs> um, so I really enjoy that kind of interaction with the, with the people. And I get a lot more of that interaction when I do trip reports. So yeah, definitely I, some- I find that gratifying. Definitely something I noticed at the end of the videos is where you invite people for questions and, and comments. And another thing I really noticed in, inside of your trip reports, and that's something that I do really appreciate, is your honesty in, in, in videos. Why would you be this honest? This honest, not this honest. <laughs> Why would I? Or Yeah, like sometimes be, I'm like... Paint, paint a rosy picture about how the flight experience was, stuff like that. No, but also sometimes where you say like, where you honestly say like, oh, I don't know this. Oh, um, I, I think people know when you're, when you're making stuff up. Um, and there's so many, uh, I like to call them keyboard warriors out there. Oh yeah. Who are looking to uh, pounce on any mistake you made. Um, I had a, a local guy, I'm not going to go there. Um, <clears throat> anyway, there's, there's a lot of grammar police out there. There's a lot of airport police. There's a lot of uh, airplane police. You know, there's, there's a lot of those, those types out there. So rather than, than kind of make things up, I, I, I think I learned that through my engineering career. It's like, if you don't know the answer, I think you're usually better to say you don't know the answer rather than try to fake it. I think people know when you're faking it. Makes sense. Did you notice a change in, in the type of comments that you received ever since you started showing your face? Um, I get more comments. Um, I, I don't I don't know that the the type is is different. The majority of the comments that I get are like great content, very informative, uh, things like that. And then every once in a while, you'll get a question. Um, thankfully, most of them are not the grammar police. Um, I'm an engineer. I don't, I don't, I'm not a good speller. My grammar is not necessarily the best, but uh, thankfully I don't get too much grammar police. That's great. Fantastic. Then I, you also upload your videos all, all in 4k, but how do you handle these gigabytes, terabytes probably of footage that you have? Um, man, I've got <laughs> how many, how many hard drives? So I've got, as I said, I got a, <clears throat> I have a fairly high end rig. Um, I don't remember what I, it's, it's kind of old now, but it's still chugging along pretty good. It, it, it's, I, I, I run an Intel, uh, seventh gen I seven chip with two different raid drives, uh, solid state main drive. Um, my external, I, external raid external storage drive i got a, a 10 gig external you know so um and then older older footage i i i put that up in the cloud and get it off my system so i i've got boy my system probably has about 30 probably close to 30 terabytes of storage all told <laughs> full uh no thankfully it's not full so it it uh, I, I overbuilt the storage knowing that I was going to be doing 4K. Um, and I've actually expanded it a little bit. Uh, I bought, a, I think, a 10 terabyte external last year to get me up there. But uh, thankfully, none of that's full. And as it gets like half full, I that's when I start putting stuff up in the cloud. So <laughs> if, I mean, if you're going to if you're going to do 4K, if, you, if you're if you're if you're me and you're looking for high quality video content, um, which I, I, I hope that's kind of a, a trademark of, of my videos. I, I really try to have high quality video, um, at least 4K video. Um, sometimes the, the, the content gets a little eh at times. Just can't help that. But um, so 
I'm, I kind of made the commitment. I'm like, well, if I'm going to use 4K, I, you got to understand that 4K is going to take just tons. I have a little travel case with uh, six. I've got six 128 gig, gigabyte cards for my camera. And then I've got six more. Those are standard SD for my big camera, my Sony a7 that I use. And then I've got um, another six for my RX0 that I use for most of the actual trip report. So, um, yeah, so I've got memory cards everywhere. It's, it, it's kind of crazy. And so it becomes something else you have to manage as you're traveling. Um, one, of my, one of my big things when I travel is I, I, I've always really wanted to be less, less stuff. I, I feel like too many people have too much stuff. Um, and I think it really, I don't, I don't think people realize how much all that stuff probably uh, hurts their trip, trip experience. I really, I really think when you're dragging all these suitcases around, um, if you don't have to, especially if you're traveling overseas, I see people pack, you know, and they, they check these extra heavy, large bags, and then they carry on the, the largest suitcase they can, they can bring. And I always wonder, do, do you really need all that stuff? Do you want... So I'm kind of a minimalist traveler in that respect. I travel with a backpack. Um, I don't have the biggest suitcase you can get. So when I travel overseas, it's, it's stuff, you know, as much as I need. And, and so um, even my camera gear, when I took my mother to Paris back in 2009, that was really the first time I looked for a camera. And my, my priority when I bought the camera was to get the smallest camera I could get. And at that time, it was a Sony... Uh, so a little Sony handy cam on about maybe five inches tall and it had a, you held it vertical and it was, it was great. It was 1080p at that time, really super quality, but it was super small too. So it could fit in your pocket. You could, you, if you had a little, little shoulder bag or something, it would fit in that super easy. So my, my priority has always been really tiny, small, compact travel kit. And so actually I've got my, so here, here's my, this is my trip report camera, my Sony RX0, and that is fantastic. Um, I don't know what you find, but when people see a big camera in an airport, at least in the U.S., I get a lot of weird, uncomfortable looks from people. So I, I, this provides kind of a stealth, you can just kind of, you kind of hold it and go, hmm, nothing <laughs> to see here, you know. I definitely had, nothing to see here. To... I definitely had that with uh, the mistake I had buying my gimbal. Uh, I figured bigger is always better, but then when you have that thing, you're running around with it. First of all, you don't want people to think that it's a it's a gun, especially right. in the U.S. Um, yep. because it's a big like thing that moves in in in, in your hand. Um, so that was the first thing, and and it was also just too large. It did, and I just like you, I try to pack as little as I can and then trying to grab that thing out of my bag was horrible. So I'm glad my new yep. phone has uh, proper built-in stabilization. So <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about upgrading my phone for that reason. So especially when you're, when you're boarding an airplane, um, I've, I've actually switched to my iPhone when I board airplanes because I, you know, when you, when I was holding my, my, eventually I switched to a handy cam. My first 4k was a handy cam. And that was, I don't know, like that big, right? And so that and that big around it, it, it was quite large. And so you ended up holding it kind of down here on your side. And that made the flight attendants and made the other passengers very nervous. The looks you get when you're boarding the airplane, people would be like, what is, what, what is that guy doing? I don't know about that. That doesn't look right. Um, so, but I found that when I, when I get on an airplane today, I hold my iPhone kind of, like chest high horizontal because I want to get horizontal video. Right. And so I use my iPhone when I'm getting on the airplane and people just really don't even think twice about someone holding their phone in an odd place because everybody's got a phone. So it's, it, it does, people can just kind of ignore that. So I'm thinking about upgrading my, upgrading my phone to the new iPhone pro because of the camera, because I'm a tech nerd and I, <laughs> I like all that stuff. I can really recommend it. Uh, it's a great poem. Okay. So in, in your videos, you do indeed say that you're a minimalist traveler, but there's another niche, I would say, um, that you um, 
that you are is a type of a traveler. So I want to just um, watch a quick clip here um, from one of your videos uh, that you posted in, at 1st of April. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen? There we go. There you go. Cool. So this is a, sh um, a short clip from your, your first time on the Airbus A220 with Delta, um, but it, where you for, flew in, in domestic first class. But what I yep. want to talk about here is what you're eating. So let's watch a couple seconds here. The tray yep. table was the cold chicken salad gluten-free lunch. Not that this is a bad lunch per se. Um, if you've watched earlier trip reports where I've gotten this, this is probably the 12th time I've had this. It was good. So um, part of your, your niche as a, as a YouTube YouTuber um, doing trip reports is what you're eating. Um, yep. You're, you're eating gluten free. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I was, I was diagnosed at a very young age when I was living in Seattle. Um, I, my, I, I don't remember a lot of details, but I was often, often just kind of sickly as a child. You know, I didn't, didn't, uh, spend a lot of time with the doctor trying to figure things out. Finally, at some point, our, my, my pediatrician said to my mother, Hey, I think he might be celiac and might be, might need to get off gluten. Um, there was no, at, at that time, I don't think there was a, a real diagnostic test. So it was just kind of a guess. Um, and turned out that was probably, I, I still have never uh, kind of like a COVID test. I've never actually been tested for that either, but I've never actually been tested for celiac, but evidence agrees that uh, a gluten-free diet is a necessity for me. So I've, I've been gluten-free um, I've, I've had a few moments here and there throughout, throughout my life when I've, I've strayed off the path and I've paid for it. It's not, not worth it, but, uh, um, yeah, so, um, I, I don't, I've never really played up the gluten-free angle per se in, in, in kind of the, the titles and things. I, I mention it as, as kind of how it is. And I, I do get a few, I've started hashtagging gluten-free in a lot of things. Um, I think to help people out who are looking for stuff on YouTube, but I'm, I'm not really made a, made that the focus of, of what I'm doing. I, I, I kind of look at that as just kind of a, Oh, and by the way, um, I do gluten free as well. So, but that particular, because I live in, in Boise here, um, Delta provides most of the connections out of Boise. I, I think you mentioned that on, on one of yours, like Edmonton, you have to go somewhere else. Well, I have to go to either Seattle or Salt Lake city most of the time. <clears throat> which means Delta. So I, I have status with Delta and I fly Delta a lot and I've upgraded to first Del the domestic first a lot. And as a result, I get a lot of lunches because I'm leaving Boise in the morning and then on the long flight around lunchtime. And I get that cold chicken <laughs> salad a lot. And as I said in that clip, it, it was good the first time, maybe even the second, but after uh, it had to be, I could probably go through my videos and count it. It, it feels like a dozen and it, it, it's not really that good anymore. Um, anyway, I, I, the, I had a chicken and rice once and that was much more preferred than, um, <laughs> than that cold chicken salad. I noticed I got it a lot when I flew on MD eighties, like MD 80, MD nineties, uh, the Delta had. I would, I would get that a lot. I think there maybe it was the galley. Um, I've often suspected that it was, you know, I flew through Minneapolis quite a bit. I'm like, well, that's Minneapolis. That's the, what the kitchen can make. That's gluten-free there. And, and so maybe, maybe that's, I, I've never quite figured out why I get that. Um, and so to, to get that from Salt Lake city to, I think that was Salt Lake city to Dallas was like, <laughs> what are some of the um, other um, stuff? struggles or would you say the problems you have being celiac um when traveling um that that's a pretty pretty normal thing so it doesn't traveling doesn't make it any more difficult i guess um you know you if you go to a store you read labels if you're in france and you're trying to read a label it's a little more challenging because you have to know 
what gluten is in French, for yeah. example. Um, I ran into that. It took my wife to Paris uh, like five years ago now. And no, eight years ago now. Wow, that's been a long time. Anyway, need to do that again. Um, but, you, you know, you're trying to read labels or you're getting, you're going to a restaurant and you're looking at, at what on the menu you think you could eat, uh, things like that. Um, so because of that, I, I, I tend to be a little bit more cautious about things if they're not labeled. Um, you know, you ask the cooking staff I had, um, first time I went to Europe and went to France in particular, I printed out little cards in French to say, you know, I'm, I'm a celiac or I think in Europe it's a, it's coliac or something. It's it's same, same thing, but you know, you can't have wheat, barley, things like that. You, you print out a little card that you can give to the waiter. Um, Obviously, in in France, depending on the on your your interaction with the waiter, you may or may not get a good response. I, I find that most of the time people are are, are pretty willing to help when they can, um, and a lot of people try to help. Um, and even after you explain it to them, even in you know in the U.S. and various parts of the world, they don't always get it. the The interesting thing is, I went to Amsterdam last fall, and um, that was one of the better experiences I, I had right up until the last the last night. Um, you know, all of the places I went were very accommodating. Um, everything was labeled very nicely. The stores were great. Um, there's enough English on everything that it, it wasn't really an issue for me. I didn't have to. I didn't have to get my card, and I, I didn't actually bring any. I'd done enough research that that it, I, I figured it wouldn't be a problem you kind of know what things you can eat and what you can't eat. And unfortunately, a lot of things that are gluten free are really not health food. (laughs) Um, Obviously fresh fruit, you can always eat fresh fruit just about everywhere you go. You can get fresh fruit. Um, But the other thing that is usually gluten free are just kind of plain chips or crisps. Mm -hmm. If you're in in the UK crisps, Um, those are, those are going to be gluten free and you get a bag, you get a bag of chips and you can get a banana and a bag of chips and that'll tide you over to, you can go to a restaurant and actually have a, a more meaningful chat with the server and, and say, you know, I got this and this and this. And I, I find that Europe is actually much more accommodating than most of the U S. Um, so. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I've obviously coming from Europe and Holland, I, uh, I definitely have seen that, Gluten free has been very popular over the past couple of years, which have I don't know how that is in the U.S. But do you think it has improved the situation over pretty much since it became more popular to eat gluten free? Yeah, it uh, the thing that I'm I'm as someone who needs to be gluten free, the thing that always can kind of concern me is that it was be more of a fad than anything else. You're right. It's you know I'm going to be I'm I'm a normal human being. I call them on my video. I call them norms the norms get a good good meal and i get a gluten free meal right cuz gluten free food generally or historically hasn't been very good i mean it's 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 usually very cardboardy very dense not it's not great saw, a lot of it is not great i saw your steamed chicken in the in the lounge <laughs> yeah yeah so you, you you know but at at the end of the day you still need to have some sustenance cuz you are traveling uh, traveling, even if you like to travel, is still stressful. And so you, you need to keep your energy up, um, try to be energetic on the video, all that stuff. So you, you try to eat things. So when, I, when I'm traveling, I actually eat probably a lot more fruit than I do at home. Because um, when I'm at home, I, I, I know I can go to the store, I can look at labels, I can, I can find things I can eat. I cook, I cook my own stuff. When I travel, I like to get a room with a kitchenette and occasionally I'll find a market and, and do that. The last time I was in Paris, we, we had the kind of a apartment hotel, had a kitchenette. And so I cooked a lot of my own food there, which is really a shame when you're in, in France and you can't eat a little French food. It's just kind of a bummer, <laughs> but uh, I get to go to the, I still get to go to the cool places, um, which at the end of the day, food is a big part of a lot of places, but um as a, I'm kind of a coffee nut, so if I go to if I go to France, then I, at least I get to drink the coffee, so <laughs> espresso. That's great. <laughs> so aside from uh, Holland, then what are some other places that you would say are good places to go as a as someone who's celiac? Um, really, I, I've had really good luck in the UK. I've been I've been to the UK twice, um, and and I found that the second time they're even more accommodating. I think they were more 
much more aware in the UK than I think a lot of places. Um, going back to Amsterdam would be an easy, easy thing to do because I think there's a lot of awareness there. Um, I think there's the thing I found I found about Amsterdam is there's a lot more, I guess, interest in people's well-being. It seems like um, I don't necessarily always find that to be the case in the U.S. Um, you can kind of see that happening right now. Um, a lot of people probably don't really care about their fellow man in the U S is, is one thing I find. And I, I've, I, it was, that was a nice thing that I found in Amsterdam. I think a lot of people were actually uh, would, were willing to stop and, and take some time and, and interact and, and were happy to see you. And I don't always get that here in the U S even being an, a native, you know, that's um, the, it's kind of a hard question because I'm still, this was going to be my big year of travel. It turned out. And then everything shut down. Um, Singapore was pretty good. Um, I didn't have any, any big problems in Singapore. Most of the, uh, most of the places I've been, um, I think people have a, a pretty good understanding of, of the consequences. And, you know, so um, they're, they're really willing to work with you. I, I can't, no, no place really stands out more than, I really think Amsterdam kind of did the best. Um, I kind of did myself in the last night. I, I went off the range and that trip report is not one of my favorites. And I really would like to redo it on that 747 uh, because I was, I was miserable that day. My stomach was in knots and I almost canceled the flight because I was feeling so bad. Um, the KLM 747. Yeah. The KLM. And now they're all retired and I'm really disappointed about that, but I was, I, that, that's not my, my, I think it's an okay trip report, but it's not my 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 best. I, I was really not feeling well that day. But anyway, well, <laughs> they're all gone now. So so sad. Like the the, the victims that yep. from the coronavirus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I was really hoping, like especially as a Dutch, Dutch person, like the going to ship hole and just seeing those blue birds and especially this 747, it's so iconic. And yeah. knowing the next time I go back to my home country and I won't be able to see him, that hurts. And and this is the second time in, in just a couple couple years because it was the MD-11 before that. And, yep. and and now we're just left with Dreamliners and 777s and, yep. and, and A330s. Um, and actually talking about the A330, uh, the 777, I want to show a quick clip because before 2017, you had never flown on one. Nope. Let's uh, watch a couple seconds here. If you can see the screen. There it is. Got it. Ah, perfect. So this is actually a, um, a, a video you did back in 2017. It's one of your earlier uh, trip reports. Uh, let's go yep. watch a couple seconds. I, I had to check my records because I've flown the United 777-200 as well. And it turns out that we've both flown on the exact same 777 uh, right from this video right here. But what cool. surprises me much more, how come you, in all your life that was your first 777 in 2017? Well, uh, up until... Um, I'm trying to remember why what that trip was. So up until last year, the vast majority of my travel was a function of whatever work I was off to do. Mm -hmm. So because of that, a lot of the routes that I flew didn't have any wide body anything. Um, and so flying anything with two aisles domestically was kind of a logistical problem um, because my employer at the time was paying for all of those travels. It, it, it was really difficult to try to finagle a trip with anything other than like a 737 or, you know, a 320 or something like that. Um, and so I think 
trying to remember where I was headed for that trip. Cause I went to Chicago. I'm trying to remember where I ended up from, from the, what was the next trip after that? But anyway, um, I th- no, actually, uh, boy, I don't remember. I honestly don't remember, but that, that was one. Once I figured out, I guess it's part of that development. Um, as you grow in your love of av geekdom, av geekery or whatever, I like to call it av geekery. Um, as you grow in your av geekery, you, you start realizing all the tools that are out there where you can actually see what the airplanes are. Um, I think you had a question from a viewer a couple, couple episodes back about um, this was, I think from a non av geek kind of person, like, what's the big deal? Why, you know, why do you care about the airplane you're on? My answer, <clears throat> and I wanted to answer, I was like, oh, oh, I want that question. I want to answer. The answer is the airplane you're on can affect how enjoyable your flight is, right? Um, I would prefer an A320 over a 737 because it's a little bit wider in the fuselage. And so as a passenger in the airplane, you get a little bit more room next to the bulkhead on the side. You know, that doesn't seem like a, seem like a lot. It's inches, but over the course of a five hour flight, four or five inches on the side really pays. One of my most memorable in a bad way flights was I was next to what, what I think were probably, they could have been WWE wrestler guys. These two just huge guys, they were each like six, probably six, five, and we're on a 737 or a 757. They're both like six, five. I'm in, I'm on the window They're They're in the other two seats. And I, I remember spending the flight kind of bent this way because they were so big and it was, it was a long flight. <laughs> and so you know, if you do a little research and you can find a flight with two seats instead of three seats, you're going to have a better flight in case your what I call my single serving friend happens to be six five, three fifty, and maybe a linebacker for football team or something like that. That's what he it, used to call. It him. matters. That's why what I it, usually it, call him like the, the the American football player type, uh, uh, single serving yeah. friend, your your neighbor. Yep, and, <laughs> and so the the type of airplane matters. But going back, I'm all over the place here, but going back to the original, why I hadn't flown on a 777 is really just kind of because I wasn't paying for the travel is really what it came down to. So I, I actually, I don't know, retired. We'll call it retired last year from my, from my nine to five job in the corporate world. And so 2020, end of 2019 and end of 2020 was going to be kind of, I, I was going to spend most of this year flying around just enjoying life for, for this year until I figured out what was next. Um, and of course then, then everything gets locked down and you can't fly anywhere. I, I, I was debating on whether I was going to fly on every 747 I could get my hands on or actually do around the world trip or, or both. I was, I was like, well, I don't know which one I want to do. And, and you know, when you don't have to go to a nine to five job and, you know, I invested very nicely for all those years that I was a manager and those things. So I, I can take a little time off and I can travel and just refresh my existence, I guess. And so this is a kind of a, I was supposed to actually be in Europe right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Originally I was going to be in Europe right now. Um, flying on 747s because then, and now the vast majority of them have been retired. I think you can get a British Airways or Lufthansa is probably about it anymore. Uh, Korea. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's three types and then same with the A380 sounds like they're getting retired soon as well. And I haven't flown on one of those yet either. So I'm still trying to, as I say in my, I think I say to my, my channel trailer, I'm just trying to fill out my map, right? I have a very extensive domestic travel map but my international map is, is still pretty light. And so I'm trying to, I'm really trying to, that was what I was going to do this year is really try to fill out the international map a little bit more. So hopefully, hopefully the world starts unlocking and we can start traveling a little bit more, but uh, it had, is what it is now. Had you booked any cool flights that you had to either cancel or postpone or were you um, lucky enough that you didn't have to go through all that stuff? Um, I, I only actually had one, one trip that I had scheduled my, so Let's see. My last flight was Friday, the March, Friday, March 13th. Um, it's very memorable Friday the 13th. 
and I was in um, I was in Dallas with my friend uh, Matt Cochran, and we were watching airplanes. And that's when the European flight ban was announced. Um, and so the the last flights from Europe were were coming into to DFW there. Um, and then so I get home, and the states start requiring two week lockdowns when you get to when you get there. And at that point, it just was like. Well, this this spring break trip I had planned with my son, we were going to go. He he loves zoos, um, so we and, he, and aquariums, and we were going to go to Florida. He loves the beach, like I do. I'm a beach guy. If I if I can be on the beach, I'm happy. So we were going to go to Florida, visit the Tampa Aquarium, the Tampa Zoo, stuff like that. Spend a week, spend better part of a week down there for spring break, and then everything shuts down, and so I had to cancel that that trip. Um, <clears throat> I have rebooked it. We're, we're, we are rebooked for the middle of July now. Not necessarily wanting to be in Florida in the middle of July, but uh, we'll see how hot that is. Uh, it, I think it's going to be kind of miserable, but uh, we'll see. You cross it bridge so when you hope, get there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the travel is worth it. And so I'm hoping that nothing nothing bad happens between now and then and Florida stays open. So, Well, fingers crossed. You mentioned yep. Matt there. I think he's your spotting buddy, isn't he? He is. Okay, because I want to share a quick clip because I think you can hear him in the background and I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, if you can confirm, if you can see the screen. Not yet. Not yet. You should, you, <clears throat> you, you're already prepped, but I recorded it, so... I visit Atlanta pretty often for, for work. And that's where I first met Matt. Mm -hmm. I can go back over all this, but I have, a, I have a clip of him leaning out over a hotel rail. I call it the Matt Cochran safety video. That would be, that would be a good one to show. <laughs> if you threw that one up there in post, cause he, he's a, uh, he's kind of crazy. <laughs> well, we can maybe try to find that one after this one. Uh, Yeah, I'm not. <clears throat> I'm not sure it's not related to my internet too, because it, it, it. It's. I'm guessing. There we go. It's right. probably showing up on your uh, showing up on your uh, your end. It's still kind of a lag getting to me. Maybe. Maybe. Anyway, so uh, Matt is. I think your spot spotting buddy, and this is uh, a video you posted a couple of years ago. Um, yep. Let's watch a couple of seconds here. I know which one this is. <laughs> I just don't hear anything now. Do you hear something? No. Oh. <laughs> That is weird. For all 688. Virgins have been way tardy today, ladies and gentlemen, but this is not a virgin. It's a Sir Francie. Air France 688 here to join the party. Oh, nice. Oh, it looks so awesome. Fighting that wind. He's doing a really good job of it. There we go. Oh, a little sideways, but we got it. We got it. Excellent work, Air France. <laughs> uh, this clip uh, oh, yeah. is fantastic. Um, Does Matt ha have his own comedy show or YouTube channel where he can watch? He his does. He does. <clears throat> yeah, he he would be he would be an interesting interview for you to do. It's not he, he doesn't do trip reports per se. Um, he doesn't get to fly too too terribly often, but uh, he goes really to Hartsfield in Atlanta pretty much every weekend. He's been going there a little bit more often these days to catch a lot of the cargo flights and stuff, but. Uh, Yeah, he's he's a blast to to hang out with at the airport. He's he's super energetic like that most of the time. Um, it's it's fun that, that I'd forgotten about that one. I thought I thought that was going to be the the flagship clip when uh, Delta got their first A three fifty. I was actually in Atlanta. Um, I think that actually might have been a subsequent trip. But regardless of that, he he is yelling at the top of his lungs, "Flagship, flagship!" And it's 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 pretty fantastic. So, and that was before I really talked. Back in back in those days, I I just let him do the talking. I did the filming. He he's filming on his own too. Um, and his priority is not 
stable video per se. It's <laughs> so it's it's a completely different experience to watch one of his videos. Um, it's off-putting to a lot of people um, because the the camera does shake so much, but his energy, I think, brings a lot of people in. And I think he's he's actually he's over ten thousand subscribers on his on his channel, so he's he's doing pretty well um, in that regard. But uh, it's not it's it's definitely his he, his passion. It really is his passion. He 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 loves airplanes more than I do. I know that. So, <laughs> but yeah, he's a lot of fun to be around. What's his, so uh, he and I were he, he and I were in Dallas. That was our, our last time we met up. So, what's his uh, channel name? Um, I think it's just Matt Cochran. Okay. Oh, well, we'll look it up and maybe we can uh, have him on the podcast some sometime later on. I I did actually manage yeah. to find the um, the video you mentioned when we tried to um, uh, get the screen sharing working. Um, I I haven't seen this one myself. Uh, if you can see the screen this time. Yeah. Perfect. I haven't seen this myself, but it's a quick, quick 19 second video. So let's check it out. Also quiet. Yeah. <laughs> He, uh, yeah, anything for the shot. <laughs> I think we're on the, so that hotel, the Renaissance, if you go to Atlanta and you like to watch airplanes, uh, staying at the Renaissance hotel is definitely the place to stay, get a balcony, make sure you get a, I would recommend a high balcony. I think that's, uh, I think that's 10th or 11th floor balcony. And so there is a, it, it kind of is a stair step that goes down. So he doesn't have, 11 floors to fall. He only got like one floor to fall down if he, if he does tip over. So he'd still get really hurt. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, anything for the shot. Anything, anything for a good shot, eh? It will maybe bring some yeah. safety gear next time. <laughs> and so when I, when I go to Atlanta, I make sure I stay at the Renaissance there. And <clears throat> if the Renaissance would like to comp me a room, I'd be happy to, to take a comp room in, in exchange for a mention on the video. <laughs> Uh, anyway, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I want to move on to the questions from viewers uh, because as with every uh, episode of the podcast, we do, um, I ask you on my Instagram and Twitter accounts where, of course, I also announce the next guest for the podcast um, to ask some questions for our new guest. And you've also sent in some questions for uh, John here today. So uh, let's go uh, see what the, the viewers wanted to ask you. I have uh, a couple questions sent in. Uh, the first one coming from Joey's Flight Gallery. And he's asking, No, I know Joey. What's your dream destination? Um, I, 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 that's actually a really easy question, a really easy one for me. Um, nearly every day of my life, I think about going back to the Maldives. Um, it, it, it is the the pictures and the video do not do the colors justice they're, they're really close they are really close but there's nothing like seeing the shades of the blue and the green and how clear and just beautiful the water is the people were just super nice friendly welcoming um everything about that is just i'm obsessed with the maldives and the only the only negative about going to the Maldives for me is it is on the literally, literally on the other side of the world from, from here. Um, it was a 12 hour time difference when we contact the kids. So, which makes it pretty easy. So, okay, it's, it's four in the afternoon. So it's four in the morning at home. And so from that perspective, it was good, but, uh, that, that's the only kind of downside. My wife is a, is a really good traveler. Um, how I got her to, to go to the other side of the world. I don't, really know but i think she's in now so but uh yeah i i i'm always i'm always down to go to the maldives hop on that singapore airlines direct flight from la to singapore and then one more to the maldives and i'm, I'm in i'm in <laughs> but that's a long time though it's like what is it 12 hours to get to singapore and then what was it another eight hours to get to um where was it no to japan, is the, it, to japan and then another eight hours to to get to to Singapore. 
So the the way we did it at the time, um, it, it's it's it, again, this is one of those funny things that changes over the years. Uh, I at that time, so you could you could book Singapore Airlines from Los Angeles to to Tokyo to Singapore, and then from Singapore you got a direct flight to to the to Malé in the Maldives. Mm-hmm. The 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 flight from LA to Tokyo is scheduled for eleven, and then the flight from from Tokyo Narita to Singapore is another I think seven is scheduled. Um, but today you could fly from LAX direct to Singapore on A three fifty the ultra long range version. You could fly that, and it's scheduled for up to like seventeen hours. So. Well, so if you if you fly the Narita route, you get an hour and a half, two hours in the airport to walk around. But the the total travel time is more. You know, at the time when I when I when I did that trip, I really wanted to have that layover, and and get out and walk around a little bit. Uh, went to the Singapore Grand Prix last year and did the ultra long haul thing, and I'm 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 sold. <clears throat> Premium economy, or better was awesome. You know, the premium economy, I, that, that's the first real flight that I actually got some significant sleep on. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause you get the recliner seat and you you can get your legs up and not, not a foot rest per se, but you actually have a, a, a little brace to support your legs. Mm-hmm. And I'm not a fan of the foot rest I, cause you, you have to hold your feet on the foot rest, but when you just can have your legs on the kind of a lazy boy kind of chair, uh, I, I slept for, I, I it's on the video, like five, five to seven hours, something like that. Um, it was fantastic. I, I loved everything about that. And my single serving friends on the way home were, were awesome. It was a, a mom and her little boy, Joshua, who was watching the Lego movie and singing. Everything is awesome. And it was, <laughs> it was fun talking to them. And it was, so that, that, that's probably my favorite trip. I don't know if that question is going to come up, but that's probably my favorite trip. Second, my favorite airplane trip. My favorite destination is still the Maldives though. Fantastic. But yeah, so it's a little easier to get there today if you're willing to to commit to up to like 17 hours on an airplane. But you know, if you can sleep on the plane, which a couple adult beverages doesn't hurt that either. And, and so, yeah. It's, it's really cool that you mentioned it because on um, no Phillips, who I had on the podcast last week, he was doing his 80 hours around the world and he didn't do the LAX yep. Singapore, but he did. Um, but he mentioned the Singapore to New York flight. And it it's astonishing that flight because that is literally going from one side to the other side of the world. Because yes. depending on the direction of the wind, they either decide to go one way or the other way around. And I, I was like, what? Yeah, that that's crazy. That is crazy. Yep. Where, like, where, yeah. where Haitian is going nowadays. Yeah. It, it's funny. It used to be, I, I know the first time I flew, so we flew back from, when we came back from Maldives, we went from Singapore to San Francisco, which is odd to me that you couldn't fly from Singapore to Los Angeles. It's actually a longer flight than Singapore to San Francisco. Mm-hmm. It's the, all that crazy geometry stuff and the circle and the circle. So we flew back um, economy on that, on that flight. And that was actually a miserable flight. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I was like, I'm never, ever going to do that again. I'm always going to take the stop in the middle. And then I did the premium economy version and like, oh, okay, that I can do this. This, The premium economy, not an economy. I would not recommend that really for anybody. If you can sleep in economy, by all means do it. Generally, I'm kind of keyed up and excited to be on an airplane. Being on the airplane is just exciting to me. So sleeping on the airplane has always been a little difficult. Um, Anyway, so I, I managed it on that on that Singapore trip. So I'm, I'm kind of sold. I think I would if we go back to the Maldives for our next for our 25th anniversary. I'm, I think I'm gonna go. We're, we've been kicking around Fiji or Tahiti as well as other other possible destinations. I, so we'll see. Yeah, flying an Air Tahiti Nui would be kind of cool. I think. Yeah, but you've you did the uh, Singapore triple seven, but. If you're in coach there, that's actually one of the few remaining airlines that still flies nine abreast on, on the triple seven. Whereas like most right. of the airlines have now moved on to a ten abreast, which makes it a slightly more uncomfortable. Yeah, ten abreast in a triple seven is 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 uncomfortable. The the my first triple seven, I think that was ten abreast. Um, 
on that United flight. And at that time they had, I think they had just upgraded the, the interior and the call button was in the, I think I mentioned that on the video, the call button was in the armrest and I've flown on one since, or I've flown one with the call button in the arm since, and they've, they've like put a, a kind of protector around it now, but at that time there was no protector. So throughout the entire flight, and it, thankfully it was only from Denver to Chicago. So it's a little less than two hours. You bing, bing. And the flight attendants were just getting up. Uh, bing. All, it was, I think they were incredibly frustrated too, but very annoying. Almost as annoying as having a, a crying kid behind you. If you've ever had, had that kind of flight. So. Oh, I've, I've, I've had orchestras. Uh, the, the, yeah. That 777, actually, it's now, nowadays, it's used mostly on domestic flights. The first class is actually eight abreast. Would you believe it? Is it really? Wow. Two, four, two. Huh. And then uh, wow. half, half the seats are facing backwards, which actually, which I said, is fantastic because you get really? a fantastic view on the G90. Uh, through the window. Oh, yeah. Yes. Were, were you startled by the GE90 the first time it started? It's been a couple of years the first time, but every time still, I love it. It's one of my favorite it, engines, it, and I cannot wait for the GE90X. Yeah. Uh, when, when that thing, that I was, I was, I was still, I was a fairly experienced traveler by that point. And we're on that Singapore Airlines uh and the G nineties fired up and I, I thought it was, the engine was breaking and flying apart. Cause it was the, the buzz saw sound <clears throat> was just so startling. It was like, well, I like to fly, but this doesn't sound right. <laughs> but uh, after doing it again, it's like, Oh, okay. And then I can, then I could really enjoy it. And it's like, Oh, this is, this is amazingly powerful. Yeah. Cool. Let's move on to the next question, which comes from Toronto underscore Pearson underscore air spotter. He's asking what type of class do you like the most? It could be first class comfort plus or the main cabin. Um, I, I think I would love international business or I really would like to fly Singapore airlines business class. Um, Pretty much at this point, I had hoped to already have flown some sort of international business class. Um, for domestic flights, um, <clears throat> my favorite domestic, I, I think the easy answer is always a domestic first class seat is best. Um, I, I don't think I can, with a straight face, say anything other than that. Um, my, my actual favorite domestic first class is on a Boeing 737 by American Airlines. I think they're, I like, I really like their seat. Um, you can still get a seat back screen on some of those. Um, the seats got all these like little teeny tables and kind of hidden nooks and crannies and stuff. Um, I really, I really like American airlines domestic first class product. I think that's, it's pretty good. Um, the highest class I've flown internationally is going to be the Singapore airlines premium economy, which I would wholeheartedly, if you're, if you're on a Singapore airlines flight, and it does have regular economy, spend the money and get the premium economy. It's, it's so much more comfortable. Um, that whole seat experience is pretty cool. It, it also has nooks and crannies. Interestingly enough, I wouldn't take the extra legroom seat on, on the Singapore Airlines flights. Um, sounds like a good idea, but in my case, I end up with headphones, um, camera gear, maybe a blanket, a pillow and all that stuff. There's no place to put any of that stuff. Because it's bulkhead, and, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you, you can stretch your legs out. Um, there's nothing, the bulkhead's like six feet away. So it's, it's exit door basically super roomy, but if you have to get up and, and do anything and, and you want, you know, you want to walk around the airplane, you, you, you've got all this stuff and there's really no place to put your stuff. There's no <laughs> pocket really. And so I was, I was actually a little disappointed about, about that seat. Cause it's just like, yeah, yeah. I don't, so I wouldn't, I would not do that again personally, but uh, yeah, I, I was hoping, I was hoping to head back to Singapore for the race again this year. Just, I found out yesterday the race was canceled again, which is a super bummer. And I was going to try to, to, to get in their business class. I tried to upgrade last when I came back and, but they had no upgrades available or no seats. They said there were empties. They just, I don't think were interested in <laughs> taking my money for whatever reason. It was kind of surprising to me, but um so that one looks pretty amazing, but really they all look amazing. 
Um, I, I find it funny because I haven't, because I haven't really gotten the chance to be in those international business class, um, let alone a first class international suite. And th those look amazing. <clears throat> I find it fascinating when some of the trip reporters complain about those because I think they've forgotten what the back of the airplane is like. Um, so I think it's, it's good. I watched a little bit of a little bit more of Jeb Brooks the other day where he talked about, you know, sometimes he still flies in the economy. He prefers business class, but he does fly in the economy. I, I think if you don't do that as a troop reporter, I think you're, I think you're shorting your audience because you, you need to keep your frame of reference fresh for what the back of the airplane is like. Cause that's where most people who probably watch your channel are actually sitting. And so I think, I think you're doing them a disservice if you don't sit, sit in economy from time to time as well. So I, I compare that usually with headphones. It's once you're used to good audio quality, yep. you can never go back to regular ear pods, right? Yep. Um, yep. And I, I've used ear pods for, for the longest time until I got these and I don't really want to use my, my ear pods anymore. Not even the, the not even the wireless ones, just the wired ones. Um, yep. So that, that's I, actually why I one of the reasons I flew Southwest this last week is is to to you know keep that experience fresh. The low cost carrier experience is a is you know significantly different than Delta's domestic first class. So <laughs> absolutely. Um, last question is coming from Alberta Aviation, and he's asking or her she's asking. What's the oldest aircraft you've flown on? Well, I don't have any video of it, but when I was growing up in Seattle, <clears throat> I know that I flew on a DC-3. <laughs> um, so back, that would have probably been during like the C Seattle, I don't know if they still do it. I think it's been, probably been canceled this year with everything going on. But um, during Seafair, probably this would be in the 70s. And even back then, it was probably still the old airplane I'd been on. They were giving rides from Renton Field or Boeing Field, one of those, um, on a DC-3. And, and you take off, took off out over the lake. And I, I kind of sort of, it, it had like bench seats inside. I kind of sort of remember the bench seats and kind of sort of looking out and seeing the water and um, on the airplane with my mother. And, and she didn't, I don't think she really liked it, but she was trying to be brave for, for me. I was probably, I don't know, six or seven at the time. Um, I think that's probably the oldest airplane I've been on. Um, you know, it probably still flies around. Those things are like tanks. Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty amazing. Um, so as long as you like every, every other airplane in the world, if, as long as you do the maintenance on them, um, you, they're probably fine. Um, uh, in, in Nampa here, pretty close to where I live, um, we have the Warhawk air museum. And I, every year I'm, I'm late and I, I ask too late, but they have P-40 Warhawks and then they fly in some P-51s. Of military aircraft, the P-51 is actually my favorite military aircraft. And that I, I've been trying to score a ride on one of those for years. And every year I ask, they're sold out. <sighs> and because of the COVID, I think they're not giving rides this year. So again, I, I missed another year, but... That that's actually one of the one of the aircraft that I really am wanting to get a get a, a ride on. Um, hopefully, maybe next year. Uh, so that that would definitely qualify as probably the oldest if I if I was able to get on one of those. So I just think they're beautiful with the Merlin engine. It's just it's a beautiful airplane. If you find yourself back in Holland, uh, I know they're doing uh, scenic tours with a with a DC three there as well. Oh, cool. Yeah. And it's fairly affordable too, so that's pretty cool. I still gotta get myself on one of those when I'm when I'm back home. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, let's go on to the next part. I think that this is something that where your nerves might come back uh, because yeah, I'm nervous again. <laughs> You're gonna quiz me about airplanes. Exactly, because that's with every week a week's episode. We're going to test the knowledge of planes of our of our guests. Uh, last week, no, only had five um, correct. Um, I have felt a little bad about that because I kind of overestimated or underestimated the difficulty of those photos. Um, so <laughs> I felt a little bad about that. So no, please come back to try it again and we'll uh, get you some better pictures to get a, a better score. Sorry about that. 
Uh, this week, I, I made sure that the pictures aren't too tough. Um, so uh, let's see how well John does on the on the pictures. There uh, again, uh, just as uh, two weeks ago by Josh Waddle. I hope you like your mug that I sent you. Um, so uh, let me know if you send me a picture if you have it. Um, how confident do you feel, John? Um, medium. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a good answer. I, we'll, we'll, I'll let you know after we're done. I should. I should. I. This is part of what I do when I travel is I watch airplanes. Mm -hmm. So I should do okay, but I've just probably doomed myself to failure right there by by saying I think I'm going to do okay. <laughs> Could, Ho hopefully I can do more than five. Sorry, Noel. <laughs> Um, can you confirm if you can see the screen? Uh, yep, I got the cross check. Hey, in, in one go. Perfect. Anyway, um, yeah. I am going to grab my timer on my phone here. Um, so how, deta how detailed of an answer do I have to give? Do you need 737 is enough or do you need make, manufacturer, just, all that? Just the type, not the, okay. not the variant. Um, if, if it's a CRJ, for instance, and you say a 700 instead of a 900, I kind of do, um, um, uh, think that's okay. But if you say a CRJ okay. 200 for a 900, then obviously that's, uh, that's not, uh, yeah, they're very different. <laughs> exactly. So I'm going to set a timer here for uh, a minute. And, uh, when you are ready to go, then I'm going to show you the first picture, um, of the plane. I'm ready. Cool. Three, two, one, go. Uh, that would be a CRJ. That's a 700. 900, but it's oh, correct. Damn. 737. Yes. Uh, that's a triple seven. Yes. Uh, A330. Yes. 747. Yep. 800 or 8i. So that's a E175. Yes. Uh, that looks like an A330. Yep. Also an A330, that's a cargo version. Mm -hmm. That's correct. 717. Yes. Fun on that. Uh, another 737. Yep. Uh, 787. Yes. Uh, that's an E190, isn't it? Yeah. And that looks like a A2. What's that, A320? Time, A319. 19. Oh, there's only one exit door. Yeah, <laughs> it's 19. Well, you ended up with a 12. Congratulations. Wow. That puts Good. you, let's, let me see. I haven't listed it. Um, I think a shared uh, second place, I believe. Okay. Uh, Good. I'm not Got more than five. Again, sorry, Noel. <laughs> I'd like to meet Noel. I think he would be fun to talk to. I'm looking forward to your uh, your episode with him. Yeah, because obviously um, with him, um, the, the podcast got um, posted on the internet with uh, the same time that we are recording this right now. Um, just let me make sure. Um, no, you're a, a shared third place with Jeb Brooks. Um, okay. Uh, Billy Gilbert still is on second place uh, with 13. Uh, Alex Perklowski is still in, um, in first place with 16. So well done, John. Yep. Thank you so much. That is uh, a fantastic awesome. score. Uh, and that is uh, the end of the podcast. John, how did you like it? That was fun. We'll have to, we'll have to like check in in a year and see where we're at in a year. That is actually a fantastic idea just to see post COVID, how things have changed. I think that's a great idea yeah. to, to do for a, uh, for a, a second season. Who would you like to see on a future episode of the podcast? Who would, who would you like to nominate? So the, the, my first thought, and you've already done it, like we've talked about was Noel. He was going to be he, several weeks ago when I, when I, when I, when you approached me about this, uh, it's like, who would I want to talk to? Noel would be a good one. Um, so I, as I said, I'm looking forward to that. Um, We've talked about talking to Matt. I, I think, I, I don't know if, he, that, that could be interesting. It could, it, it could be a train wreck or it could be fantastic. You, um, because he's not a trip reporter per se, he's, but he's super into aviation. He would probably, 
he would be good at your quiz. I think he's <laughs> he he even knows general aviation stuff. Uh, the other one that came to mind, um, I, I've noticed you're, you're given you know some some time to to some smaller channels. Um, I think it's Sean's travels. Uh, I recently subscribed to him. Um, he's got a, a smaller subscriber count, but um, he would be interesting. I don't know if he would appear because he's not current. The videos of his I've watched so far, he's not actually showing himself or doing voiceover yet. So he may be a little more, he may not want to, but I, that he, I think he does. I, I really like his, uh, his camera work. I think it's, it's really nice and sharp and he's got uh, some really good graphics. So, but his trip reports are, are text on screen. So as I said, he, 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 he would be interesting to, because I think he's, I don't think he's got as much under his belt. I mean, as we talked about, I've been, I've been posting and doing various versions of myself on YouTube for since like 2011. So I've, I've got very, of a very diverse background. I didn't just start doing trip reports. I think, I think he's probably just, he reminds me of me five years ago in a lot of ways. So that, that's why I find, that's why I subscribed. I found it interesting that, that, oh yeah, I remember, I remember doing almost this exact video because it, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of where you are in the process, I think. So. Cool. I'll, I'll go check out this channel. Maybe it's, uh, it's interesting to have him on the, on the podcast, obviously if he, if he wants to, well, thank you so sure. much, John. I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining me for the past Ooh, hour and a half almost. Hour and a uh, half. Wow. Time has time flies when you're having fun. Oh, absolutely. John, uh, thank you so much. And, um, yeah, I, I would really say good luck with the channel and uh, keep posting great content because that's really, really why I wanted to, to have you on today. So uh, thank you so much for joining uh, me today. Uh, that, that's very kind of you to say. And I, I had a blast. This was a lot of fun. I thought it would be fun. So that's why I said yes. And uh, thanks for having me. And um, maybe I'll get up to Edmonton and we can, uh, I don't know, fist bump or elbow bump or... <laughs> I don't know what we'll be doing by by then, but uh, Bluetooth high five. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was cringy. Oh my god. Uh, thank you so yeah, much, John. <laughs> um, and with that, we're uh, at the end of the podcast. Uh, next week, unfortunately, there's not gonna be a podcast. Uh, I have some other stuff, unfortunately, that is gonna take up all my time for the whole week. So that doesn't allow me to prepare and make a new podcast. Um, so thank you so much for joining me for this one and then see you again in two weeks for another podcast. Make sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter so you know exactly who's going to be the next guest. Make sure you follow John on his YouTube channels and his social media as well because uh, he really has some great content. Thank you so much and see you in two weeks. Bye. <laughs>